So the, the Old Testament reading for this morning is from the book of uh, 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And this is actually a song uh, that Hannah sings. Hannah's the mother of the prophet Samuel. And she had been unable to have children for quite a long time and is finally uh, given Samuel, but uh, he's going to be a prophet. So this is the song she sings after Samuel's been born. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighted. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and rises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversaries shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. The New Testament reading is from the Gospel according to Luke, uh, chapter 1, verses 39 through 56. And this is what happens after Mary has been told by Gabriel that she's going to uh, be pregnant with Jesus. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him, from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, he has brought down the powerful from their thrones, and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. Here ends the reading. So last week, we read about the angel Gabriel telling the elderly couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, that they'd be the parents of John the Baptist. And this is a miracle because until this point, they hadn't had children and had given up hope of ever having children. This week, we fast forwarded a little bit in time. And Mary, Elizabeth's relative, has been visited by the angel Gabriel and told she's going to give birth to the Messiah despite being a virgin. And Gabriel also tells Mary about Elizabeth's miraculous pregnancy. So Mary decides to visit Elizabeth, and that's where our lesson starts. Now, often the scene in Luke in the church is called the visitation because it's, it's a visit. Sometimes the church names things very literally, and sometimes it's called something ridiculous. But this time it's, a, it's pretty like one-to-one -one correlation. So Luke doesn't tell us why Mary went to see Elizabeth, but we can assume it was to see the miracle Gabriel told her about 
in person. And it was also probably for some solidarity in the whole miraculous birth thing. Like if Mary were looking for someone who can relate to her experience of being told by an angel she's going to give birth to a special child, Elizabeth is about the only other person who's got some idea what that's like. It's not exactly the usual way of bringing children into the world. So Mary visits Elizabeth, and when Mary greets Elizabeth, Elizabeth's baby leaps in her womb. Now, given the space constraints in wombs, it's also fair to say the baby kicked rather than leaped. It depends on how you're going with definitions. But um, this somewhat odd moment is demonstrating John's role to prepare the way for Christ. Part of that mission is pointing people to Christ, and even in utero, John the Baptist is doing that. That kick is pointing to Jesus. Now, in response to this leaping, Elizabeth says a blessing on Mary. And some of Elizabeth's words here are in the Hail Mary prayer, uh, so those parts might be familiar. But what's really interesting about what Elizabeth says is that without Mary telling her anything, Elizabeth knows exactly what's going on. Elizabeth calls Mary the mother of my Lord. So Elizabeth is the first person in scripture to confess Jesus as Lord and God. And Protestant reformer Martin Luther taught that this declaration made Elizabeth's words the very first Christian sermon. He called it the first sermon on earth. So that means the first sermon wasn't by someone powerful or important, but was preached by an elderly woman. One of the, the major themes of the Gospel of Luke is uh, Luke focuses on how people society views as unimportant are vitally important to God. Now, the other Gospels point this out, and so does the rest of Scripture, but this is a theme that Luke takes extra care to highlight. So at the beginning of the Gospel, Luke centers on the experience of women who were of lower social status than men. And Luke is the only gospel to tell us about the parents of John the Baptist. And this scene between Mary and Elizabeth is also unique to Luke. Mary visiting Elizabeth is one of a handful of scenes in scripture where two women actually talk to each other. There's something called the, the Bechdel test, which is a sort of like shortcut test to see how well films and television or books represent women. And to pass the test, the, the movie or whatever it is, it has to have a scene where two women talk to each other about something that isn't a man. <laughs> now, often people add another caveat that the, both women have to have names as well. So uh, this scene between Mary and Elizabeth is one of only uh, three places in scripture that pass the Bechdel test if we include the requirement that women have to have names. So the other two places that pass are uh, the Gospel of Mark. There's a scene when the women are heading to the tomb on Easter morning in Mark, and they have a conversation about, like, how are we going to roll away the giant stone? And then the book of Ruth has lots of conversations between Naomi and Ruth because uh, they get a lot of screen time. <laughs> so Luke's efforts to highlight God's concern for those of lower status gets us one of the few scenes in Scripture that passes the Bechdel test, and shows us that the first Christian sermon was preached by Elizabeth. And we see more of God's concern for the least of these if we look at Mary's response to Elizabeth's blessing. So Mary sings a song of praise that's usually referred to as the Magnificat, because that's the first word when it's translated into Latin. Now Mary's words were inspired by the songs of women in scripture before her. The Old Testament lesson has the Old, Testament less, bleh, the Old Testament has a lot of songs sung by women at key points in Israel's history. And the lesson we read this morning from 1 Samuel is a song Hannah sings after the miraculous birth of her son, the prophet Samuel. Now, Hannah's story mirrors the experience of Elizabeth, and Mary's song has a lot of similarities to Hannah. And that makes sense, as she'd be familiar with scripture. It's very likely that... Uh, Hebrew women would have been particularly familiar with the parts of scripture that other Hebrew women had said. So both songs talk about God bringing about changes of fortune and radical reversals. And if we focus on what Mary says, there are significant status inversions taking place. 
The proud are scattered, the mighty are brought down from their thrones, the lowly are lifted up, the hungry are filled, the rich are sent away empty. The Magnificat is a song that has a lot of good news for the poor and lowly in the world. The world might forget the downtrodden, but the Lord does not. Another interesting feature of the song is Mary sings it all in the past tense, like these things have already been accomplished. But that's not literally the case. Like, for example, at this time, the tyrant Herod, the Roman puppet king, he is still on the throne. But Mary singing in the past tense conveys a couple things to us. One is that this particular version of the past tense in Greek is used for things that are timeless or eternally true. So there's a sense that God's love for the downtrodden and victories over injustice are things that have happened and will continue to happen. Mary, also, Mary putting things in the past tense is a way she confesses her faith in the promises of God. Mary is so confident that one day these things will come to pass that what God will do is already, is said as already done. So the Magnificat is basically like a blueprint of God's coming kingdom and what Jesus is going to be up to. This confidence that God will change the world and these radical reversals of fortune, they make the Magnificat really similar to something like a protest song. Probably like the most famous protest song is We Shall Overcome, which I imagine many of you know. Besides the words, we shall overcome, there's deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. And the verses go on. We'll walk hand in hand. We shall live in peace. We are not afraid. God will see us through. These are gospel themes. And the biggest one there is that God is working to set things right and will set things right. God will indeed break every chain and set all people free. The Magnificat is a song that's saying God will overcome and is doing stuff in the world. No matter how things look, no matter how bad things might get, God has not given up on us yet, and nobody can take that away. And if we think about Mary's context as a lowly peasant woman in Judea during a time of Roman occupation and oppression, it makes sense why she'd be singing a protest song. Mary's people were in need of salvation for all the ills of the world, and God's salvation comes hand in hand with God's justice. There are unjust rulers that need to be brought down from their thrones. There were lowly people who needed to be lifted up and hungry people who needed to be filled. So Mary sang about the salvation and justice of her God who had promised those things and who she trusted to be ever faithful to those promises. The Magnificat is both a song of salvation and a song of justice. It's a reminder that God will win out in the end, but it conveys some hard news, that to make a just world, some things need to be shaken up. We can't have the full kingdom of God, we can't experience the full salvation of God without what's wrong being put to rights. And that's good news, because there's a lot in the world that needs to be put to right. Sometimes we see things in the world that are tragedies that shouldn't have happened, hurts that cut too deep, human actions that are unjustifiable, unfathomable, or unspeakable. There's evil in the world. There are things in the world we need saving from. And the good news is we have a God who loves us too much to leave us as we are. The Magnificat shows us in compact form that many of the things that matter and define success in our world aren't actually what matter to God and they don't reflect the coming uh, kingdom of our God. God's wisdom doesn't look like the world's wisdom. The Apostle Paul writes, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. In, so in, in Mary's day, in this patriarchal society, it valued physical might and conquest. Our God chose to work through people who embodied none of those things. 
Our God, on the contrary, chose to begin this phase of salvation history with an elderly woman and a pregnant, unwed teenager. And then the King of Kings, the Savior of the world, is soon to be born as a little baby in a humble stable. By faith in God, everyday people like you and me, those who are young and old, they conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and won strength out of weakness. Our God doesn't need powerful rulers, giant armies, or people with tons of money to radically change the world. God just needs ordinary people with the courage and faith to dare to work for extraordinary things. Amen.